Genesis chapter 24, I just discovered this week, is the longest, longest chapter in the book of Genesis. It's uh, ironic when I realized that God chose 67 verses to describe something I would consider very trivial. All chapter 24 is about a proposal. It's typically a boy meets girl story or a girl meets boy story. It's kind of a Bollywood story. There's nothing really, nothing really deep or meaningful, at least in the periphery. And uh, especially when you consider Genesis is the book which talks about creation. You know how many verses God used to describe creation? 31 verses, chapter 1. <laughs> So I'm going, God, where is your sense of priority, right? Like, you know, you used 31 verses to describe the story of this universe, you know, everything that is within it, how it was created. And then you went more than double that to talk about a proposal, right? So that is what actually piqued my interest when I read that. What is God so interested in this? characters and proposal in, in this particular story we see in Genesis chapter 24, right? First of all, that is uh, the chapter in which we are introduced to a new character in the book of Genesis called Rebecca. It so happened that we have two Rebecca sitting right in front of, so now I am seeing why, you know, it's funny uh, Walsanango was talking about the wow factor, and sometimes we don't get bored uh, looking at God. The more you look, the more you realize. And I had one of those moments this Thursday at Starbucks. Again, that's where most of my moments of revelation happen. You know, I normally drop off the kids at 7.30, and then I sit there up to 3.30 when, they had to, when I had to pick them up, and that's the time when I do my work. I have some deadlines, and I have to submit this and that. But every day I start with a half an hour of Bible reading, and I, I do half an hour, at least half an hour, like, you know, maybe 40 minutes or so. I, I was reading this, you know, because I was going through Genesis, and chapter 24 came, and this verse came, and then I was stuck there, and, you know, and there was this moment of wow factor kind of started uh, because of the same thing. What is so great about this proposal? And I started doing this and doing this, and, and uh, 3 o'clock, the school bell rings, and I was there up to 3 o'clock. I, I couldn't do anything because, you know, there was this time when I said, God, I don't want any message today because I know exactly what I'm going to preach today. I have a sermon prepared. It was actually the second part of my first sermon I did. You know, I did a sermon on giving, and very strangely, many people appreciate it. Uh, normally, the sermon on the giving sermon. So I, I thought I'll push the envelope and do a second one on giving. So I had all my sermon ready, and I didn't want to, God, I don't want any revelation today, but, you know, anyway. So I, I'm going to share some of the things I wrote down this Thursday, and I hope uh, it will be uh, meaningful uh, to at least some of you, if not all of you. First of all, since we are talking about Rebecca, it was completely coincidence. I didn't expect that you were going to be here, Rebecca, or you were going to be here either. Um, um, I realized one thing about Rebecca this, this Thursday, which I never knew about her before. The patriarchs, you know, the patriarchs of Israel, right? Who are they? J uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right? So these three patriarchs are important, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And their wives are equally important. Who are their wives? Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel. They are the official wives, right? And when you compare these three women, Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel, and there's something very interesting about Rebecca. One thing is that, for example, Sarah. You look at Sarah is an amazing woman, obviously. She was with Abraham all through the process. Uh, but you know what she did to Hagar? was really, really a mean thing to do, right? Like, it was not Hagar's idea to get pregnant by Abraham. She conceived the whole plan, and Hagar got pregnant. Then Sarah became jealous. Not only is that she became jealous, she became very mean, right? And she was making this poor woman, Hagar's life, miserable, right? And then she eventually ran out of the house, and she was in the wilderness, and then God spoke to her at this place called Berlachai Roi. I'll come back to that. And then she came back to the house. Then she thought everything is okay because God asked me to go back and be submissive to my, to my 
you know, master, and then she did that, then she had the child again, then what happened? Sarah got even more mean. And she kicked out this poor woman and her only child, Ishmael, and if it was not God for, for God's intervention, they would have died. The child would have died in the desert, right? You remember the story, right? Uh, that's very mean of Sarah. I know she's a wonderful woman. And, um, you know, I mean, if I use the American president's language, it's, it's what we call a nasty woman, right? He's a nasty woman, right? And Rachel is also kind of a, Rachel was also kind of a nasty woman. You remember? She was so jealous of her sister. And then her sister started getting pregnant, and then she was whining and complaining because she was not getting pregnant. Then she said, okay, take my, you know, uh, uh, my uh, maid, and, you know, maybe I'll have the child. And then eventually, you can even see later, Rachel is the one who's uh, is stealing the family idols and a lot of stories of uh, nasty women, you know, coming out of both Sarah and, and Rachel. But Rebecca is just, a very wonderful, God-fearing woman. Maybe something we could say a little manipulative would be that she, uh, she encouraged Jacob to go and get the blessing before Esau get all of it. But I would partly justify it because the Bible very clearly says that uh, Isaac was a little too, you know, Isaac really loved Esau. You know, so as a mother, she wanted to even it out. You know, that's what every mother would do. And so I'm, going to, I'm willing to give her a be, the benefit of doubt. But other than that, you won't see anything which you, you will come from a nasty woman. Like, you know, Sarah, I'm not saying that they're nasty women, but there is something nastiness or meanness in all these other two patriarchs' wives as opposed to Rebecca, right? But even more interesting about Rebecca, what I, I see is this. So... Uh, the story of chapter 24 is where Abraham calls one of his servants, and we believe it was uh, Eliezer, even though clearly not clearly mentioned. And to Eliezer, he said, go and look for a wife for my son. So you have to go back to my home country, and you have to find a wife for my son from there. Now, that place, Mesopotamia, is around 600 miles through the desert from where they are. 600 miles, okay? So, Eliezer asked, what if the woman will not come with me? It doesn't really make sense. Why don't you send your son with me? Like, you know, if there is no groom, how can I go and propose? It is not like, you know, they can confirm, they can look at a picture, or who am I going to marry, or anything. This is 600 miles away, and I had to go, what if the woman doesn't come with me? That's a very legitimate question. Because you remember, Jacob went to Laban's house, and that's how he got his wife. And Abraham was given his wife because it was part of the family. They were in the same place with all the family. Now, you are asking me to go to this place 600 miles away. Now, that may not sound much to us, but back in the days, they only had camels to go through the desert. You know, I'm, if I'm going to assume maybe 20 miles a day, they can travel with all this caravan. It is almost a month away, a month distance away and he has to go, and what if the woman doesn't come with me? And then Abraham says, if she doesn't come with you, then you are absolved from this oath. That's a very legitimate question, right? And the same thing you can see if you read chapter 24, again and again that question comes up. What if the woman doesn't come with me? What if the woman doesn't come with me? That is a good point because any woman with some sense in her head will not go with this servant, Right? Let me ask you this question, right? Like, you know, I, I don't know how many. Natasha, you know, somebody comes to your door one day, right? <laughs> you know, I am your uncle's servant, you know, your uncle's servant from Chennai. An uncle you have never met, you have never heard of. And that uncle had a son. I don't have his picture. I don't have his quality. I'm, I don't have anything to say to you, but you have to come with me 600, you, I can, you cannot take your dad or mom or sister, nobody with, with me. You had to come with me all the way to Chennai 
you're on top of a camel, <laughs> right? And uh, would you want to come? You know, you can get married. What in the world will make you go like that, right? And if you're a woman with some sense, you won't go, right? And what if you go through all these, all these miles and miles through the desert, you know, the, the snowstorm and the sand and the rocks and the wild animals and the bushes and all this after this, and finally reach the destination, she looks at Isaac and what if, <laughs> what if Isaac was not that a cat, right? You know, that, that's possible, right? You know, that, that is the ulti, extreme case of an arranged marriage. What, you know, what if at the end, you know, she looks at Isaac and finally I reach here to see my husband and see, what if Isaac was like, I don't know, what if Isaac looked like somebody like me or something like that? Not necessarily that, you know, you should see our Joanne's picture in our wedding, wedding picture. You know, she, was, she looked very disappointed, right? <laughs> <laughs> it could have happened. <laughs> Not anymore, but you know, at that time she thought, oh, this is what I'm getting to. <laughs> so it could have happened to, <laughs> it could have happened to Rebecca. But this woman is such an audacious woman, bold woman, courageous woman. She just went with this servant. Servant, you know, I mean, if somebody brings a proposal, can my uncle come? Or uncle's son come? Or some relatives come? You are sending the servant of that itself doesn't sound good, right? And what if he's an axe murderer for Pete's sake, right? Like you, know, you go in the desert and you're a woman, you're going with this man uh, who claimed to be your uncle's servant. That, that, is, that story doesn't compute at all. But she takes that step of faith and she goes. And uh, it's, it's funny, you know, uh, even her brother and her mother, they are, not, they are a little hesitant. They are saying that, okay, uh, so the, the, the funny story is that this guy comes in the evening, Eliezer comes in the evening to their house, right? And he does this, you probably know the story, but you know, he, he thinks, okay, what would be the woman my master's son want to marry? So he kind of makes this pact to himself. He talks to himself, I'm going to sit by a well, and when women come to draw water, I'm going to ask the women for water, and, and the woman who is going to give me water, and also water for my camel. That would be the, you know, so this is not God saying to him. He's kind of making up some of this, you know, how to identify a woman. And it says that the moment he said that, that's exactly what my uh, scripture says. The moment, when he finished saying that to himself, then comes Rebecca, exactly at that point. It's like a divine coincidence, right? You know, exactly the moment, that verse is also repeated a couple times in that chapter. And there is something about that proposal which is miraculous. That's why that, that stretch of, you know, the words which comes in. Anyway, so he says this, when he had finished saying that, then comes Rebecca for water. Uh, you know, and then he asks Rebecca for water, and Rebecca gives him water. And he not only had that he gives him water, he gives water for 10 camels he had. You have no idea how much effort that is going to feed a camel, right? Because, you know, camel stores the water, right? <laughs> you know, so the, it's not a gulp. It's not a sip. And this woman gave all this. And then Elias said, okay, I'm going to come to your house with you. And she said, welcome to my house. And they go to their house. And this is happening. All this happening in the evening. During the, at the time of dinner, he explains all this thing to her brother, Laban, and uh, dad, Bethuel, and mother, and all that. All this discussion happened. The next day morning, they, they get up, right? So next day morning, as they are going, so morning they get up and the, and the servant says, oh, it's time to go. I need to go. Rebecca has to come with me. Then they say, oh, yeah, that's fine. But, but, you know, we are willing to. They are willing to give Rebecca. But you just came last night and you are going now. But, you know, let, let her stay with us. Okay, let me read this. This is very interesting. Uh, 24 verses, 55 onwards. This is what I say. But her brother, this very human story. It's almost like I can picture this happening in my house. A proposal happened to my sister, and this is exactly as a brother and as a mother, I would say to my, my sisters, whoever is going to come, right, the proposal. But her brother and her mother said, let the girl say, stay with us 
a few days, say 10. Afterwards, she may go. Isn't that a fair thing to ask? Because she was in our house all along, and suddenly somebody comes in the evening and next day morning, you know, let her stay with us for, you know, we are going to get her married to your masters, and that's fine. Let her stay for a week, 10 days. Is that okay? Is that, it's, it's a fine request if you ask me, right? It's a fine request. So, so, so the servant said to them, do not delay me since the Lord has pro prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, now the brother and mother said, we will call the girl and consult her wish. Let, her ask, let us ask her. Let us ask Rebecca, right? Do you want to stay for one more week or 10 days, you know, before you go? <laughs> and they asked Rebecca, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. Really, Rebecca, really? She's just, she's just as cool as a cucumber or something like that, they say, right? She doesn't even think, yeah, I'll go. I, I'll be hurt if my daughter or my sister says something like that. Suddenly, you can just walk away with a stranger who just, you just saw him last night, and we brought you up, and you are just ready to go. Now, that is something I really like about Rebecca. The audacious faith. And we call Abraham the father of faith. And if somebody has to be called mother of faith, and I think that is Rebecca, my interpretation of it. I know I'm, I'm stretching into the ladies' meeting, cater, so I'm going to get away from this portion. But I, <laughs> I believe this kind of faith, that that's exactly the journey Abraham took, all the 600 miles. Abraham took that journey. The same journey, and the same journey she is following, but she is following just like Abraham into the unknown. She has no idea where she is going, but you know, Rachel also took that journey, Sarah also took that journey, but they knew exactly where they are going because they were with their husband. They had protection, they had covering, they had friends, they had relatives, they had church or whatever, but Rebecca had nobody, and she had that audacious, courageous, Faith to do something when it was supposed to be done. You know, sometimes when God asks you to do something, even though it sounds crazy, you feel like doing it, just do it. Amen. Don't just delay it. What would have happened if she stayed for 10 days? And I believe that if she had stayed for 10 days, you know, the, you know what they call blues or marriage, there's a phrase. Anyway, you know, she would have hesitated. I mean, should I go? And, you know, I mean, after a couple of days, you, maybe I should stay with my parents. So don't leave any kind of room for doubt. And very often, we are good at finding this kind of excuses. Particularly, some people say, you know, yeah, let's pray about it, brother. It's a good thing. It's a good gesture to pray about it. But sometimes we use that as an excuse. Sometimes you don't have anything to pray about. God asks you to do something. Just do it. Maybe you're stupid, but then God will come and correct it because if you did it in your sincere heart, not for your own sake, and you took that audacious step of faith, even if you make a mistake, God will come and help you. And I'm telling you from my own life. You know, I made so many mistakes. But when it is from my sincere heart, God will come and, you know, don't worry about it. You know, we will go at the story of Peter. Anyway, but Rachel had that, 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 that kind of relentless courage to take that action when it was supposed to be taken. Right? Anyway, sorry, Rebecca, Rebecca. That's all about Rebecca, and I'm, I'm, I'm done with Rebecca. Let me go to Isaac. <laughs> um, so, I'm coming back to the verse we read. 62, verse 62 of chapter 24 says, Now Isaac had come from going to Bir Lehi Roy, for he was living in the Negev, Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. There are a lot of things strange, strange in that, in that scripture, just that one verse I read. First of all, the fact that Isaac lived in the Negev. Now, if you were part of the uh, Tuesday Bible study, we have done this many times. Negev is a hill country. Uh, it is a deserted place. It's a hill country in, you know, south of Judea. People don't live there. That's not where people live. The only, you know, scholars are still debating even if that is the right word because, because nobody, it's not a place where people live. The only two kind of people who you see in Negev, they say, are bandits, are hermits. 
which are monks or robbers. That's the kind of people who kind of hide there so that when they are in the hill place, when people go down, you know, and they can come and attack, or the monks who want to spend some time with God in isolation. And so it is a very strange place for, for, for Isaac to live, to live. He was living in Negev, okay? Now, even more interesting, now Isaac had come from going to Bir Lahai Roy, forgive my Hebrew pronunciation pastor, but you know, something like that, right? Bir Lahai Roy. So this place is also interesting. When you go to Genesis chapter 16, we don't have time to go. This is a place, Hagar was deserted. You remember, Sarah was mean to Hagar, and Hagar went all the way into the wilderness, and she was being all by herself, and then she saw a spring, and there God spoke to her, and she realized that I saw the God who sees me. And that's how that place was called Bir Lahai Roy. You can read Genesis chapter 16. Bir Lahai Roy means something like the God who sees me. It is in the middle of nowhere. It is a place when you go, when you are exiled or excommunicated, when nobody wants you. That's when you go to Bir Lahai Roy. That's where Isaac was. And it's, it's written, now Isaac had come from going to Bir Lahai Roy, which really means that he had a habit of going to Bir Lahai Roy very often. That's what it is written. And if you go to chapter 25, verse 11, you will see, Isaac, when after the death of Abraham, Isaac took over the camp, Isaac camped in, God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac lived by Bir Lahai Roy. Now that is interesting. Abraham's camp was a place called Mamre. Mamre's, you know, big, uh, they, it was mighty oak trees. It was a lot of trees and very beautiful place. The oaks of Mamre is very famous. That's where Abraham put his camp. But Isaac changed the camp from Mamre to this place called Bir Lahai Roy, which is in the middle of nowhere, in the wilderness. There is nobody there fascinating. There is nothing interesting there except the fact that there is the one God who sees me. Now that makes it even more interesting, right? That's the third, you know, now we go to the third strange thing in that verse is that he meditated in the, you know, so, so Isaac went out to meditate in the field. Now, who goes to the field to meditate? Why should you go to the field? People go to the field to till the land, to sow the seed, or to water the plant, or in the end, to harvest what you have, right? Right? That is why people go to the field. Now, Isaac is somebody who went there and he spent time to meditate. Now, now that makes it even more interesting, right? So Isaac had this, you know, I mean, I would have asked if I were in, in Isaac's uh, time, you know, what is this boy doing here? Abraham, you know, you have, you know, other children there. You know, why is your child, instead of going and working in the field, why is he going and meditating there? So he had this, he had this intense desire to walk with the Lord. And you won't see that phrase with Abraham. And you won't see that phrase with Jacob. You know, they, God speaks to them, but they, you won't see that phrase of they were meditating. They were meditating. They had an intense craving for the presence of God. Now, you know, this is why Isaac, in some ways, I feel that an underserved character in the, among the patriarch, like he's almost like the middle child, right? Like, you know, the middle child's always find it difficult to, you know, get, get into that, that, that position of prominency. So you have Abraham. Abraham is very famous as the hero of faith, right? Faith hero. And Jacob is famous as the action Hero, right? He's the one who fought with God. And he is the one, he is the, the leader of the, you know, from him come the 12 tribes of Israel. But very rarely we talk about Isaac because he was not, he was not necessarily, you know, you know, all we know is that he married Rebecca. That's his big story in the Bible. Except 
Genesis chapter 22, there is this, there is this story of Abraham's sacrifice. Now, I'm going to spend a little time there to, I wanted, I wanted to rethink that story. I, I, it kind of makes me feel sad. We read that story and we give credits to, credit to Abraham for all that what has happened because it's the story of Abraham's sacrifice, right? Now, if you go back to Genesis chapter 22, we don't have to read it. If you read that story from Isaac's perspective, and I want you to rethink and rethink, who is the actual hero of that story? So Abraham was asked by God to go to Moriah and sacrifice his only son, Isaac, right? And, God, and Abraham takes Isaac with him, and they are going to the mount. Now, people have dispute as to how old uh, Isaac was, but we know that he was old enough to run away. And we know that he was old enough to outpower Abraham. And Jewish tradition say he was 37 something, and Christian tradition say all the way from 30 something. So there is, there is you know, and, and also in the beginning of that story, it's, it, Isaac smells something fishy, right? He asked, Dad, we have everything set up for the sacrifice, but where is the lamb? So he knows there is something wrong with this, right? And then Isaac says the God will provide, sorry, Abraham says God will provide, and he puts all this wood on Isaac's back. So we know that Isaac was old enough to carry all this wood and walk into a mountain. So he was strong, he was bold. He can easily overpower his old man, or he can at least run away. But when they go to the mountain and Isaac, basically Abraham binds Isaac and puts him on the altar. And I, you know, I was reading the story and I was trying to imagine myself in that story. What if I was Isaac? What if I was Isaac? Because I didn't hear anything from God. My dad says he heard something from God. Right? I didn't hear anything from God. Now here I am, I am bound, I am in the altar, I am, I am on top of the altar. Now the last thing I see is my father, who means everything to me, brandishing a sword against me. I don't know about Isaac, I don't know about anybody, if it is me, if it is me, maybe the whole world will call my father a hero, Maybe God himself will call my father a hero for doing such an amazing thing, but I will never, ever look at him the same way. Because that is the worst possible, imaginable thing you can experience. Your father brandishing his sword against you, and that's the last thing he sees. He cringes, he closes his eyes, and then he opens his eyes to see who his true father is. He hears a voice from the true father, Abraham, Abraham, do not touch my child. Do not touch the child. Now that is a big paradigm shift. And in that one split second, the whole world changed for Isaac, and I strongly believe that. And you, you know, people might call he had PTSD or he could have post-traumatic stress disorder, whatever you call. Somebody brandishing his sword against you, especially if it is a father. Maybe after that, he find himself in Negev and he find himself in Ber Lahai Roi. He was alone. He was all by himself. He was sitting and meditating. He was rethinking his own relationship. He is radically redefining the relationship he has. Who is my real father? This person who calls everybody, including ICA, calls the faith. I mean, obviously, I'm not criticizing Abraham. Abraham was, Abraham was doing an act of obedience. I'm not criticizing that. But for Isaac, only for Isaac, this story is completely different. It is not the way we look at the story. And Isaac, at that moment, realized what is his true family. That radical alteration of our understanding of relationship. I had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with my daughter uh, last week, and she was disappointed about some of the stuff happened in their school and all that. And then I said, she was expecting certain things which she naturally deserved and she didn't get. And I said, Hannah, you know, we all have to go through this, sen this process of disillusionment, right? We realized 
that this is our world, this is our people, this is the people I love, and this is the people who love me. But at some moment, God will open your eyes to see things in a different way, right? And now that happened to many people in the Bible. For example, uh, Paul, it happened to Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16, Paul says, Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. I don't see anybody in the flesh. I don't call my father, father because he gave me birth. Yeah, I know, that is a physical fact. It's a fleshly fact. But my father is not necessarily him. He is my father not necessarily because he gave me birth. Because that's what Paul says. From now on, we recognize no one in, in flesh. And Jesus himself had to go through that disillusionment. You remember? His brother, brothers and mother came to Jesus and Jesus said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? What do you mean? What do you mean? Who is my brother? Who's my, who's, uh, who, who's my mother? Who are my brothers? Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father who is in heaven, he is my brother and my mother. Now that is that process. That is what happened to Isaac at the altar. He closed his eyes seeing his human father and he opened his eyes to see his true father. Hear him, my child, don't touch him. Abraham is not my father anymore. Yeah, he is my father, He's, he gave me birth. But my true father is not just Abraham. That's why he was sitting in the field meditating. That's why he is in the mountain countries, hill countries of Negev, sitting and trying to be close with God. And that's why he is in Bir Lahiri Roi, in the middle of nowhere, trying to see the God who sees him. And people think, what is happening to this child? But his miracle was being prepared 600 miles away. <laughs> People say, what is he? He's about 40 at that time. He's about 40. He should get married and he should have a child by this time. But he said, I don't care about it. I'm going to sit and pray and meditate. When you do that, God is orchestrating your miracle 600 miles from where he is. He didn't have, you know the funny thing about uh, Isaac's marriage? Abraham's wife was given to him. Sarah, like in the family. It was part of the family. Jacob fought for his wife. <laughs> Jacob fought for his wife, Isaac. Isaac's wife was prepared by God. That's why chapter 24 is so elaborate. That is bigger than creation. That is bigger than creation. God is orchestrating. Oh, chapter 24, if you read it, it's so magical, so miraculous, so many coincidences, so many wonderful things happening at the same time because God is preparing for his child who is meditating 600 miles from there because God has now taken over the case of Isaac. And that's why one of the beautiful things about Isaac is that Isaac among the patriarchs and maybe among pretty much all other characters in the Old Testament, he was the only one with one wife. <laughs> Abraham had Sarah, Hagar. Even after Sarah's death, he married another person. He was around 120 at the time. He got married Keturah and he had children. Yeah, yeah, and then you have Jacob, right? And Jacob had Leah and Rachel, and they had the Bilhah and Silpah, all other people, they had wives and concubines. But according to the Bible, Isaac had only one wife, Rebecca. And she was more than enough for him. See, even God prepares for you. That's all you need. But if you fight for what you want, then that won't be enough. You'll have to do more and more and more. And if somebody is giving it to you, if your family is giving it to you, if your friends are giving it to you, then you will need more, more. But when God prepares for you, and that is also the beauty, you know, all the three uh, patriarchs' wives seems to have a problem with conception, right? Like, you know, they all had the problem. They all couldn't get pregnant in the first shot that I mean. Sarai had that problem. He, he was, she was barren. Then Sarai thought, okay, we will figure out a solution. And she figured out the solution. That's the solution which Hagar and all that mess that happened because of that. Rachel, same thing. She had a problem with conceived. So she also figured out a problem. Did you know Rebecca also had a problem? It is in the Bible. Rebecca also say, had the same problem of conception. You know what she did? Nothing. 
She asked her husband to pray for her. Her husband prayed. That's exactly how it is written. I don't have time to read all this. Uh, Isaac prayed for his wife, Rebecca. God opened her womb. God gave her children. <laughs> See, when God prepares for you, and, you know, you, you don't have to worry about so many things. Don't try to figure out solutions. Don't try to, be out, don't try to outsmart God. Don't try to even help God. And all what he wants you to do is to be with him in the wilderness, Bir Lahai Roy, where he, he will see the one, you know, you will see the one who sees you. And he wants you to be in Negev, the high places, in the mountains, where there are only bandits and robbers, but that's where you go and pray and you spend your time alone with God. And that you go to the field, not to work, and of course you work, but not only to work, but to meditate. And God will reveal himself to you. God will prepare his way for you. And all along, when you thought you're alone, and all along, everybody thought you were strange. All along, everybody thought you have PTSD. You th everybody said, oh, your father doesn't care about you because, you know, he was this big faith hero. He was this big action hero. And nobody understood your story. Everybody is still praising your father for the mighty things he did. And nobody cared about your pain when you were on the altar. And God says... 600 miles from here, and I am preparing Amen. this miracle for you. I'm writing your love story, which to me is more than important than the creation story itself. Rebecca, your story is written in 67 verses, when I'm writing the story of the world in 31 verses. How, that is how important it is. Isaac, don't worry about it. The one, if you see me, and I am seeing you too. And I want you to come with me to the mountain of Negev because preparation is happening right now. 